against. Okay, if you can take your seats, we're going to get started. It's very important that we start on time because there are drinks right after this presentation. So we heard from the last speakers um, about estate planning and implicit bias and touched a little bit about what happens when uh, heirs question a state plan. Now we're going to delve into that into more detail. How many of you in this room are mostly estate planning? Okay, a good chunk. Yeah. And how many of you have been deposed before? Not that many of you. So, what we are going to learn in this next presentation is how you defend your estate plan and some best practices for when the family is unhappy with the plan that you have done for the settler and is questioning you. So I'm very excited to present uh, Joe Morrell of the Morrell Law Firm along with his associate, Jeff Coons. Partner. Partner. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I apologize. My implicit bias. Yes, that is a <laughs> um, partner, Jeff Coons, and managing partner, Esther Kim, of Turner, Huguet, Adams, and Farr. And they are going to, um, Esther primarily does estate planning, and as some of you may or may not know, the Morrill Law Firm does do quite a bit of litigation. So they're going to take us through a deposition here. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, Yes, Jeff and I have dabbled in estate planning, but Esther is the uh, the resident guru uh, on that part of the presentation. Um, I had a couple of questions following up on, on Tracy's. Um, how many of you guys have drafted estate plans that uh, either disinherit a family member or treat the beneficiaries unequally? Uh, how many of you guys charge differently for that work than if your plan treats everyone equally. How many of you have different procedures? And by that I mean like internal firm procedures, outlines, or et cetera, that do you follow a different track on, on a, a, an unequal bait distribution? Okay, um, interesting. Um, yeah, so our assumption going into this was we wanted it to be um, helpful to estate planners and uh, hopefully litigators as well, but as we went through it, it became more and more evident that it is really geared towards the estate planners, um, and there wasn't a lot we could do about that, to be honest with you. So I'm glad that the audience, <laughs> <laughs> the audience seems to fit it as well. Um, in any event, also um, a couple of assumptions uh, beyond that. Um, we understand that you could be deposed about other issues, for instance, ambiguities or uh, inter interpretation, construction issues. Um, but in my experience, the vast majority of depositions and litigation, frankly, has to do with contests. Um, and so we're focusing on a trust contest situation. Um, we're going to try really hard not to lecture you um, or to get too deep in the weeds on the law. We will have um, citations, et cetera. But um, I think um, you guys can obviously follow up on that. We're trying to be much more practical and to kind of change the way, uh, not change, but maybe hopefully affect the way you think about um, your procedures and um, from the get-go, knowing that you could face a deposition at one point in time. Um, so with that, we'll get started, I guess. <coughs> Just know that we're going to make the PowerPoint available to you after the program. So, uh, and I think the the PowerPoint from our uh, first set of speakers, you'll have that too. Okay. So I know this first slide's a little. Oh, it didn't go. Oh no. That's funny. There we go. So little, little melodramatic. I know, and I told. Uh, Liz Barcel, right before this started, that I wasn't going to try to scare anyone, and then I realized that the very first uh, um, <laughs> slide's a little, a little in your face. Um, but in any event, I think it's uh, uh, it's accurate, right? Uh, anytime you have an equal distribution in your plan, uh, things are probably going to be pretty peaceful. And anytime it's unequal, um, in my opinion, you should prepare that it's that you may have some trouble. Um, I think that. All estate planners should um, 
create, revise, or tweak your procedures with this in mind from the first contact through the execution of the estate plan. Um, Following up on that, um, as soon as you have an unequal distribution, you have a potential contest. Um, there's no way around it. The drafting attorney should be on notice immediately that a contest is possible and should proceed accordingly from the beginning. Um, if it's unequal and there's enough money at issue, um, someone is gonna start looking uh, for an attorney and if they look hard enough, they'll find one. Um, and if the, like I said, if the, if the, if the money at issue is enough, um, it's going to at least be an inquiry, not necessarily a deposition, and hopefully that's what we're gonna help everyone do here is head that off at the pass. Um, it's interesting to, to talk to different estate planners as to when in your process um, you learn that a testator wants to treat people unequally. Um, I think it could happen in, at least four different spots, right? Uh, the initial phone call, uh, a questionnaire that you send out before the first consult. Probably most commonly it's gonna be at the first consult. Um, shouldn't be at execution. <laughs> uh, that, that would be a little late. Um, but I, I throw that out there because a lot of times um, when you take depositions, there's not a lot of written evidence of that fact until the actual document itself. Um, and I think that's a, a a massive mistake. Um, I know as a litigator, I want to know um, from that first call, if I can, um, whether the client is thinking of a contest. And that, and I don't, I don't even take the first call. Someone else at the firm does, who runs a conflict check. And um, a little spoiler alert: in addition to wanting to know whether it's a contest, I want to know whether the document is drafted by an attorney, um, and particularly someone that I. I will then look them up and because what I'm looking for is to find out are they an estate planning attorney um, or is this someone that's moonlighting. Um, when I hear that a disposition is unequal, my focus, my brain immediately shifts to why. You know, if, whenever anyone deviates from everything to my spouse, equal shares to my kids, I want to know why because there should be a reason, and it should be a reason that's coming from the client. The lawyers always start at equal. The lawyer doesn't, your client doesn't come in and you go, you know what, I think maybe you should disinherit this kid. I've, I, he looks suspicious to me, the one sitting in the lobby, of course. But, um, you know, why does this client want to treat her family unequally? Um, because I think if you stay focused on that from the get-go, um, your state plan is going to be better. Your, your more importantly, um, all of your evidence, everything that supports that plan that you're gonna build is gonna be better. And that's the goal really, right? To build this fortress of an estate plan and fortify it with facts and evidence along the way. Um, the drafting attorney's job is to build the plan. It's chosen by the client, as I just said. It's not, it's not your plan, it's their plan. Um, I think it's important to to make that clear to the client from the get-go that this is, it, it's, it's di more difficult work, right? It's more dangerous, it's more difficult, it's more tedious, it takes more time, you might get sucked into it later, that it's a different and more complex animal and therefore it may, it may cost more. It certainly is worth more. Um, and not just because you want to uh, charge them more. I mean, that could be something you want to do. But the real issue for me is just kind of getting them in the mindset um, that they should want you to spend the time to make sure that this plan that they've chosen is as defensible as possible um, and that they have embarked on something that's not, that, that, that is a little riskier than normal. Um, if you do charge more or you charge differently, or maybe even just in the vacuum, they may think or bring up, look, this is really expensive. Um, it's peanuts compared to the litigation on the other side. You know, I mean, um, in my experience just around the community, most litigators, the, the initial deposit is somewhere between $10,000 and $25,000. And that has to be, usually be replenished each month. Um, you're gonna 
you're going to burn through, you know, five, ten times the amount of a five thousand uh, dollar estate plan in the first couple months. Um, and I don't think clients understand that 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 is a possible outcome, even if everything goes smoothly. You know, just by virtue of the fact that that there's this unequal distribution and the person treated unequally may decide um, to contest. Uh, I would think of it as combat pay as well if I was going to char charge differently and I would, try to, I would try to get that across them as early as possible. Um, so here's, we'll finally get to the, the better news. So let's, let's let this sink in a little bit here, right? The law of the state of California is that the drafting attorney is a superhero witness. Um, and that most clients, when they come into my office and I explain that to them, they think that's insane, given that the stereotypes are the opposite. Um, however, uh, I usually joke about it and say, yeah, I don't understand how, but that's the case, right? And so that's why I'm always focused on the drafting attorney or a, uh, whether or not the document is drafted by an attorney is very important um, because that person is going to be the star witness um, to several of the issues that the litigator is going to be trying to uh, nibble at throughout the case, right? Um, which is a huge advantage to you. Most witnesses don't have that advantage. Most people don't know they're gonna be a witness in a lawsuit until something bad happens in their presence and they're drug into it. The drafting attorney knows this from the get-go and can act accordingly. And your file should reflect that. Your file is how you corroborate your testimony that's going to be given this great weight. Um, and if things aren't in your file, that's going to be pointed out. Your testimony is X, the litigator is going to say, well, why, where is that in, it's not in your notes, it's not in your invoices, I don't see it in your emails, is there a letter? Um, and so there's this like dual pronged reason to really paper the file. Quick little tip here is to always execute in your office. Um, that way you get to testify about the testator at the moment of execution, which is the, that's the focus. The whole case tends to zoom in on the moment of execution. And your testimony is supposed to be given great weight, but you won't have any testimony about your client's condition, whether they were lucid at execution, et cetera, if you weren't there. Uh, you also won't be able to provide any um, opinions or observations about whether they understood the consequences of what um, the plan was going to do for them uh, because you weren't there. You can testify about what they may have said to you prior to that, but but we're the the most important time is that moment of execution. Um, and so, you know, don't give away that advantage by emailing your plan out and having it executed elsewhere unless you absolutely have to. Um, I. I also think that if you're doing one of these more, what I would call a, an unequal plan, uh, it's a good idea to have someone else other than you notarize it if you can, um, because that adds just another witness to everything. Um, at that point, you're going to have two people that can provide observations about how the client was acting uh, at the time of execution. Um, Before we get into the, the more fun part, um, what is the litigator really looking for? Obviously, in the contest, we're looking for medical records, right? Uh, you guys have nothing to do with the medical records. You can't change that part, right? So beyond that, I think, which is probably a close second, um, would be, was this document drafted by an attorney? And did they do a good job? Um, can they testify about capacity and lucidity at the moment of execution? And I acknowledge I'm being repetitive. I'm doing it on purpose because I, I want some of these phrases to just become natural to all of you guys. Um, and then does the file corroborate the testimony? You know, are there contemporaneous notes of calls and meetings? Not just to the attorney, but of staff members as well. Um, 
because what we're looking for here is, and I'll get into this later in more detail, is whether or not the drafting attorney allowed uh, a bad guy, uh, an influencer, um, did they allow them to participate in the drafting and or execution process? That's gonna be really, really important on the litigation end of things. Um, the way I think of it is, did they let a fox into the hen house, right? Really hard to convince, I have seen it, but it's really hard to convince anyone that the lawyer is an actual bad guy. What the litigator's trying to do is show that they didn't do as good a job as they could, and that gave someone a foot in the door, or they were taken advantage of by this bad family member. Um, and if you do your job and you don't allow them to participate, um, they're gonna have a really hard time meeting that element. Similarly, uh, at some point the litigator wants to show that this change that is unequal um, conferred an undue benefit on the person that got more and was unfair to the person that was disinherited or had a, a lowered amount. Um, you again are gonna be the star witness there. You, you're gonna wanna testify about why. Why was the distribution unequal? Why did the testator want to do this? And does that explanation make sense from the point of view of the testator? And not in general, case law is clear. It, it, it is the situation that the testator finds themselves in at that moment. And so again, the more that your testimony um, can explain why this was done and be corroborated with um, the file, the, the stronger that fortress you're building is gonna be. Um, so with that broad, probably too lengthy introduction, we'll get to uh, the fact pattern. Okay, so now you've heard from Joe about what the litigator is looking for. So now we're gonna put that into the context of a fact pattern. And throughout this presentation, Jeff and I are gonna be doing um, a deposition and he's gonna be taking my deposition as the estate planner, okay? So I'm sure that you've, you know, this, this fact pattern is very unfamiliar to you, um, but it was hinted at actually by our first speakers who talked about the 55-year-old um, the son living in the house. Okay, so we've got Bud and Mary who are high school sweethearts. They are married with three adult children. We've got Art, We've got Bud Jr. and we have Carla, ABC, get it? Um, so uh, they had a prior estate plan and in which they divided everything equally among their three kids. Art lives in Colorado. He's a successful architect. He's married, he's got three kids and he's not really in the picture. You know, he lives far away and he's got a very, really successful architect firm. So. Um, you know, Bud and Mary don't really have much contact with him. Then we've got Bud Jr. Bud Jr. is like that 55-year-old man living in the basement smoking weed. He's, he's uh, unemployed or underemployed. You know, he sometimes has a job, sometimes doesn't have a job, um, just can't really launch. And so he has been supported by his parents lives in an apartment that's paid for his parents, all his living expenses, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sweet guy, but just can't really launch. Then we've got Carla, and Carla lives in Martinez. She's single, um, and she's got a successful bakery business on Main Street. And um, she's really busy and involved with her, her business. Um, but more recently, Mary fell and broke her hip. And this is after Bud already died. So Mary is um, not able to care for herself. And so Carla moves in with Mary to take care of her and to help her with all of her, you know, medications, with her, you know, grocery shopping, etc. cetera. Um, Mary was recently diagnosed with a mild cognitive impairment. And um, Mary wants to change her estate plan. She plans to disinherit art uh, because he doesn't come and see her, he doesn't care about her, uh, he doesn't need the money. And uh, she wants to give the money instead to Bud because she's worried he's going to be homeless when she dies, and to Carla, who's you know providing so much care for her. So she wants to be able to uh, reward her with that extra um, share. 
Okay, so that's the fact pattern that we're going to be using for the rest of the um, exercise. Now, I know that I was introduced to you as Esther Kim, but for purposes, for purposes of our demonstration, I'm actually going to be Taylor Smith, okay? So don't confuse the two, all right? <laughs> so when my deposition is being taken, I am Taylor Smith. All right, just want to be clear about that. So Taylor Smith, I am a solo practitioner. I graduated from Eureka Law School in 2016. And I primarily have a, um, a personal injury practice. I, I worked for a small firm in Oakland, and then I opened up my own practice. And um, about three years ago, I started incorporating estate planning into my practice as a way of helping uh, first party special needs trust you know, for settlements. And so I took a couple of CEB classes on estate planning and, um, you know, I've heard about like some study groups or, you know, something like that, but I just, I haven't had time to, to join in on anyone. And um, I went to high school with Carla. That's how I know Carla. And so she, when she told me that, um, you know, her mom needed some help with her plan, she contacted me and asked me to help her with that. Okay. So those that's our scenario. There's a little bit of implicit and explicit bias, I think, in that um, description of Taylor Smith. <laughs> Maybe a little judgy. Joe wrote it. Um. <laughs> okay. okay. So um, the bad news, you've been contacted by Carla, potentially, uh, after Mary, Mary dies. And uh, the successor trustee, Carla, is hearing some rumblings that there's going to be a lawsuit, and that Art is unhappy, even though he doesn't need the money, he's unhappy to not get his share of Mary's uh, money. Um, and there's a couple of different ways you could hear this. You could be getting a phone call from Carla. You're helping her with trust administration. Um, you could get a letter from Art's attorney saying to safeguard your file, protect it, don't throw anything away. Um, or you could be receiving a business record subpoena for your file. And you're going you're gonna to be thinking, oh, gosh, where's my file? Is it in all the right places? Is it in different places? Um, what did I include in my file? I have to get that, get that in order. Um, you'll, there could be a notice to consumer that goes out either to Mary if, she's, if she was alive, in our fact pattern she's not, uh, or to Carla as a successor trustee. Mary would have an opportunity to object to protect her file from production because it's her, her uh, estate plan. She's the one with attorney-client privilege with Ms. Smith. Um, Carla, if Mary's already passed away, she's gonna have a really hard time protecting that estate plan. That's going to be, um, that's going to be produced. There could be a motion to compel, potentially, but that, that will be produced eventually. There's evidence code sections with exceptions for attorney-client privilege. Um, and what, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do some deposition questions. Uh, in this presentation, there is presentations within presentations. Um, because we're trying to give you as much value for your, your CLE budget as possible. Um, we're, I'm going to be, it's as if Joe and I got a call from a friend who's an estate planner who was contacted and said, hey, this deposition's coming up. I've never had my deposition taken before. I'm nervous. What do you think I'm going to be asked? So that's one part of it. And then the second part of it is Ms. Smith's deposition. Uh, it's not Esther's deposition. It's Ms. Smith's deposition. Um, okay, so when we get the call from a friend saying, what are we going to be asked, uh, you're, you're going to have to, your first question is going to be introducing yourself at your deposition, like, are you represented? And if you haven't had a lot of, if you haven't had a lot of depositions in the past, it may be a good idea to be represented. It's always easier to come to a knife fight with a knife. Um, but if you, I mean, depending on the situation, you may, you may think, oh, it's not a very complex situation, I'm just going to represent myself. Um, and then you're going to be asked, have you had your deposition taken before? And in granular detail, what case was it? Um, how many times have you had your deposition taken before? Did you go to trial? Like, key will be, have you appeared at trial? Because if you have that arts attorney, in our, in our fact pattern, is going to want to find that transcript, you know, where you appeared at trial. Because then they're going to have a better idea of how you, um, you react in those situations. So they're going to ask you the introduction. Then they're going to ask you about your background, everything you've done since law school. You know, where did you work? Who did you work with? Um, in Miss Smith's case, she's mostly done personal injury. 
So she's going to be talking about her personal injury practice. Um, but she's going to be asked, how many estate plans do you do? What percentage of your practice is estate plans? Um, have you take, what, what CLE did you do? How, how did you just mose, mosey into doing estate planning? Like what was your preparation for that? Any certificates from the state bar or anywhere else? Um, and then we're going to get to what did you do to prepare for the deposition? Um, what did you do to prepare your file? Uh, what state was your file in when you first got the subpoena? Um, who did you talk to? You know, she may have to say, oh, I called my friend Joe Morrell. He's a great litigator. And he, you know, what, what did you talk to him about? You know, there's no, unless she's retained Joe, there's no attorney-client privilege, of course. Um, and so now we're going to start our deposition with Ms. Smith. I'm going to turn a little bit to face her. Let me interject real quick there. Um, before we get started on the depo part, one thing I wanted to hit again, um, because I'm, I'm, well, one, I'm biased, and two, um, I fight the same uh, impulses that you guys would have just in a different area, and that is as soon as someone contacts you that this contest is coming, whether it's the trustee calling saying, hey, my sibling's upset, or it is... Um, uh, attorney says I've been hired by someone and I'm thinking of filing something. What do you, you know, tell me what I want to, uh, not what I want to know. Tell me what you think I should know before I proceed or you get a subpoena, which that means the case is already going. Um, you should drop everything and contact a litigator. Uh, again, I know I'm biased, but I have the same issues. If, if it's, I'm allergic to tax, you know, um, anytime tax issues come up, I have to force myself to not pro procrastinate at all and get someone that knows it as quick as I can. Someone that does it all day, every day. Um, same with any family law crossover issues. Uh, I've just learned the hard way. And the sooner you get after it, the better, um, because we don't know what we don't know, right? Like we literally don't. Um, and you also want to get a litigator that actually has real trial experience, or I should say experience with real trials, ones that have expert witnesses, that last several days because that's what a contest is going to look like. Not just someone from your networking group or someone that you like drinking with at the MCLEs afterward, um, but someone that this is about your work, it's about your reputation, and you need to take it seriously from the get go. Right, um, Joe. Yes. So, one qualifier is you want somebody who is a trust litigator. Indeed. I mean, a civil litigator, great, but. This is a specific area that you really want some expertise in that it's a trust litigator. Yeah, we operate in a really weird little niche uh, as trust lawyers in general. Um, and most civil litigators, in my experience, they have a really hard time wrapping their heads around the fact that you often owe opposing parties a fiduciary duty. Um, and then they don't operate in probate court, which we all know is really weird. And kind of like I said, I'm allergic to tax. In my experience, lots of estate planners that only do estate planning are kind of allergic to the courtroom. Um, lean into that, acknowledge it, and and call somebody. Because I've never, I've never got a call from someone and said, "Geez, I wish you waited a little bit longer before you called me." It's always <laughs> like, "What you did? What? Like, how many letters did you write? You met with the family? Was anyone else there from your office?" Like, it, it's it's usually the opposite, and I understand the. Impulse because we all want to like hold this stuff together and we don't want to open that door to litigation because we all know where it can lead and we, and we just try to hold it together and oftentimes you guys are representing multiple generations of the family for a long time and so you have this personal connection but um, again going back to the earlier slide once you once you hear that the murmurs of contest you should start preparing for war because if you're prepared you're gonna feel better about it. You're gonna feel a little bit more comfortable. You're gonna feel a little more confident. You probably still won't be able to turn off the little voice in your subconscious because we can't ever do that, but you might be able to sleep a little bit better at night knowing that you've got somebody else uh, on your side. For, and, and, and maybe they'll tell you um, really good news, right? And that's even, even better. So anyway, I wanted to get to that um, real quick before uh, we went further because it's, it's something, like I said, that I struggle with. I always wanna, um, hold on to things too long. Uh. Well, Ms. Smith, um, thank you for producing your file a few weeks ago, and thank you for coming in response to the deposition subpoena. Um, could you please tell me what you did in preparation for your deposition today? Well, um, 
I called Carla because uh, when I found out that Art was challenging the trust, I mean, I was just so shocked. I, I just didn't know. So I was trying to find out from Carla what she knew. And um, so uh, I just thought that I could help Carla because I was, you know, already representing her in the trust administration. And um, so then when I got the, the, what is it called? The subpoena record something or other. Um, I thought, oh gosh, you know, I, I probably should um, tell Carla she needs to find her own attorney. So I, I she found somebody else to represent her and um, I called that attorney and they really didn't say anything. They just said, um, you know, show up for your deposition. So here I am. Now, um, one thing you're going to be asked at your deposition, the next thing you're going to be asked is what was the initial client contact like and who contacted you? Was it the actual potential elder or was it one of their children? Um, and what kind of records do you have of that contact? Now, every time you have contact with either the client or anyone in their family, you want something in your file describing what was said and when it was said, okay? Um, so, Ms. Smith, who first contacted you regarding changing Mary's estate plan? Oh, it was Carla. Um, Carla and I went to high school together, and she knew that I was doing some, you know, estate planning here and there, so she called me. Mm -hmm. And what did, what did Carla tell you? What, what did she want accomplished? Uh, well, she told me that her mom had some changes that she wanted to make. Um, so, uh, she told me, one, that, um, that Mary wanted to give Carla, actually, the, her home. Um, you know, because she had been helping out her mom so much. So she said, you know, she wanted to give her the house. And then she said that, um, you know, she really wanted to just cut out Art. I mean, Art was, you know, he's doing so well, you know, he's so flashy and showy with all his money and, you know, and he never comes to see and visit um, Mary. So that just kind of made sense. And then, you know, Mary was worried about Bud and Bud, you know, not really being able to, um, you know, support himself and she was really worried that he would become homeless. So she, she, you know, so Carla told me this is what Mary wanted. She wanted it to cut out art and then divide it equally between um, Bud and Carla. And uh, this whole initial contact about Mary's estate plan was with Carla? Um, yeah. And were you concerned that Carla's ideas for Mary's estate plan mainly benefited Carla and Bud? Um, no, not really. I mean, you know, Carla was just so upfront about, you know, how the changes were going to be made. And, um, and I knew I was going to be meeting Mary, you know, at some point. So, no, I wasn't concerned. All right. So, <laughs> next slide. All right. So, who's, who's the client? This is one of the first questions that you should be asking yourself when you are being contacted. Now, if it's there's obviously a difference between a new client contact and an existing client contact. More often than not, we get a call from a child, right, who's saying, hey, you know, my, my mom or my dad really needs some uh, work done with their plan. You know, can you help? Can you help us? It's always us, right? Um, so... You know, your client is not necessarily the one who contacts you. That's, that's pretty obvious. Um, what what of, oftentimes get in the way, too, is you will get into a situation where um, you have one person who is supposed to be your client, but the, there's another person involved who's paying the bills. So the person who's paying the bills, should they be getting a copy of the documents because they're paying for it? Should they be part of the uh, the conference because, again, they're paying for it? Um, the answer is no. <laughs> and the other, the other thing that I think has really come up that is really interesting is, you know, okay, so you know that the person that first contacts you is, is the child, and you say properly, you know, I would like to be able to meet your, um, your dad. I mean, I actually had this exact situation. Well, um, dad lives down in Los Gatos and uh, is, doesn't have mobility, uh, has mobility issues. Can't come to the office. Oh, okay. Um, so son says, hey, can we do a Zoom? 
I'll be, you know, I can put my dad on the Zoom and you can meet him that way. And I said, you know what? I think that it would be best if you um, called the, was it the Santa Clara County Bar Association or, you know, San Mateo Bar Association and found an estate planner who's local to that area who could maybe come and meet your dad in person. When you're on Zoom, you don't know who else is in that room. Um, and most kind of 80 year old, um, you know, uh, clients don't generally know how to operate Zoom by themselves. So if you are meeting somebody on Zoom, um, you're taking a risk that there's somebody else in that room that you don't know, you don't see, um, and that could, you know, really impact your ability to speak with that potential client one on one. So the, the next bullet points are establish the parameters and expectations early, like the first phone call. And one thing there, is, I think, is you made a really, really good point, and that is uh, this comes up more for me in the conservatorship undue influence setting, so it's on the other side of the estate plan. But oftentimes someone shows up, a kid shows up with a parent, and the suspicion or the allegations are that they're trying to influence it. I think, well, for many reasons, thank goodness the COVID's lighting up uh, our world, but Zoom's super convenient, but you really want to have that physical, the ability to testify after the fact that no, I met with them, I exchanged pleasantries, I explained to the kid they had to sit in the lobby, I took him in the conference room or my office, I shut the door physically, and they spent the rest of the time out there. And I know that's it's often awkward in the state planning realm, especially where the elder actually wants the person in there and fights you on it. I think it's really important at that point to circle back and say, look, you want your plan to work. You came to me to not to tell you what you want to hear or to make you feel comfortable. You came to me to give you my honest opinions. And this is really important that I build a wall around you because you don't want later on one of your other kids or someone else to claim that this was really this kid that you want in the office with you. Like, so I'm trying to help you. Like, let me help you do this. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, you know, I'm not, it's not because I don't trust your kid. It's not because I want things to be hard on you. I'm really sorry. And I always throw out, like, as a lawyer, I have to sometimes be rude. It's like my built-in excuse, right? I get to ask you how old you are. I get to ask you all kinds of uncomfortable questions. <laughs> and I try to remember I have two hats. One is me as a human being, and one is me as a heartless, cruel lawyer. And, and that's what hat I have on right now when I'm doing these things to you. Um, and sometimes they get it. Sometimes they don't. If they don't, that usually reinforces to me that they're not really firing on all cylinders because that should make sense to most people. Right. Yeah. So, you know, along the lines of that, obviously, you know, you need to state right up front, you know, I'm going to need to meet with X alone. You're going to need to sit out in the lobby. Um, and usually it's they're, they're driving their parent there or there's some reason why, you know, they, they feel like they need to be in the meeting. And by setting that expectation up front and early, um, you can continue to go back to that. You know, in our first phone call, we talked about this, and you know what, you're going to need to sit outside. Um, why don't you go take a walk around, you know, the block and go get a coffee. Um, and then after that meeting, it's really important that you put in your file, so-and-so came in to meet with me for the first time. So-and-so brought this client. Um, I asked the client to sit in the, you know, in the, you know, in the conference room with me while, you know, X person walked around or stayed out in the lobby or whatever it is. But describe exactly that, you know, shut the door. The door was physically closed so that they're not like, you know, sitting there and they're, you know, ear to the door listening. Um, and then talk to this potential client about, you know, who can contact you and whether you have their permission to talk to that person or not. Oftentimes we have children that call in and they expect us to you know, answer all kinds of questions about their parents' plan. Well, my mom told me that you know, Bud Jr. was gonna get blah, blah, blah. A kid, is that true? You are not to allowed to disclose that information because you know, you're, unless your client has specifically said, okay, you know, I allow you to speak to these, you know, specific individuals about the plan. You are not to be talking about that plan to anybody else. So um, make that clear and get those permissions up front. Uh, it also works in the other way, which is we've had clients where they say, under no conditions are you to speak to 
you know, daughter X. She is not to know anything about our plan. And if you go ahead and blab that out, well, then you'll be taking another deposition for a di different reason. Um, okay. Yeah, and so, so again, following up on that, um, I think it's important to put in your notes um, in these meetings, like who was present, where were they, so, and how much time. So like I said earlier, if, the, if you do exchange pleasantries or, or let's say you say, yeah, they can come in for a few minutes, but then I'm gonna have to ask them to leave and I'll explain why. Note that, because you will be asked that. How much time did you spend on this portion? How much time did you spend on that portion? Um, you know, note any concerns that were voiced. Um, literally ask them, how will the other family members react to what you're asking me to do? You know, what do you think they'll say? Um, and that is particularly um, powerful later on because it shows that they are thinking through the consequences of the act that they're asking you to carry out. It hits the element right on the head. I had a case a long, long time ago where uh, it, it was the best um, elder abuse undue influence case I think I'll ever have as a um, contestant. And, um, and we lost. Um, and we lost because there was an audio recording of the execution, and even though the elder was saying all kinds of weird stuff, like didn't know the address, and kept asking her boyfriend for, to answer questions in the middle of it all, she said, I know my daughter isn't gonna like this at all because uh, I'm not leaving her this house, and um, but I don't care if she'll be upset. She's, up, she's been upset for years. And um, despite the, what I thought was an ocean of evidence that went the other way, the court zoomed in on that um, moment. And um, so I, luckily it happened when I was really young uh, and I've, I've, I've changed how I do stuff um, since then. But I think that's really important. So moving on, um, every interaction you have with the client, as you've heard a couple times today, you want to document every interaction with a client, every interaction with a family member, and you want to have notes that are substantive. You want to talk about the demeanor of the client, if you can, if they're different at different times. And it's sobering, but um, the people who are in their 80s now were in their 50s in the 1990s, okay? So email has been around for a long time, and we often see clients who we're not emailing at all. And so you're not emailing with the client. You might be emailing with their assistant, the child of, of some sort, the adult child. But pretty soon we're going to have more and more savvy seniors who do email all the time. And you might as well, you know, you want to have that email relationship with them because it's another piece of the wall that you're building for your fortress when they're telling you what they directly want to do. Um, you want to have that in, the, in your file, all the emails with that, uh, that client. Um, returning to the deposition with Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith, can you describe your initial meeting with Mary? Sure. Um, well, Carla brought Mary to the office, and, you know, um, Mary expressed some, um, you know, she was uncomfortable because she felt like her hearing might not be, you know, the best. And she wanted Carla to stay in the meeting with her because she thought two, you know, two sets of ears were better than one. So, um, you know, her, her hearing seemed to be okay to me, but I, I didn't want to push the issue. So I let Carla stay. And uh, how many times did you meet with Mary? And, and uh... Uh, Once. So once. You're, the, whole time, the whole time in developing your state plan, you met with her one time? Yes. I mean, you know, Mary knew what she wanted, so I only needed to meet with her once. Right. Um, and another um, thing that you may be asked at your deposition is, do you specifically remember this client? Uh, and what did that client look like? Okay. So it's hard when you do dozens and dozens of estate plans a year for several years, but it's a good idea, if you can, to um, try to remember what the client looked like. You will be asked, like, what was their age? And as I said before, what was their demeanor at the different meetings? So just as a um, pattern of practice, we ask for the clients to provide us with um, their driver's license, and we make a copy of it. And then we put it in their file. So it's helpful to use because when we notarize documents, we have it. But it's also good to have just a, a photo reminder. And, you know, of course, uh, you know, we have people who like to hang on to their pictures for 20 years because that was the one good picture. <laughs> um, and so it's from them from high school and they're now like in their 60s. But, you know, you still kind of, you know, will, it will jog your memory as to what that, who that client was. 
So like Jeff said, I mean, you see a lot of clients. You may, rem you may remember the specific fact pattern about what it is that they wanted, but you just can't quite remember their face. Having that little, um, you know, driver's license helps you to jog your memory. And it's a lot easier to ask for that than sitting there with a the Polaroid. Hi, you want to take your picture? Click. And of course, I mean, you guys all know this, but when you get edits back from the client, especially in their handwriting or possibly through email as time goes on, you need to save those in your file, of course, because that's going to be key. The key, anything about their intent is going to be the gold standard. Um, and so moving on to the engagement letter. Okay, so, you know, what we're hoping in this presentation is that you are never called to have your deposition taken. But in the case that that could happen, you, as the estate planner, will want to get compensated for the time that it takes you to be deposed, to produce your records, to do all that preparation. And so one of the ways that you could, to, you know, do that is to put something in your engagement letter that talks about if you are called to testify about you know this estate plan that you should be compensated your your regular hourly rate and it would probably be a good idea to put something in the trust as well and um, Joe can talk a little bit more about this but you know I'm sure you've all heard about this Doolittle case and there were, there were specific provisions in the no contest clause that allowed the trustee to use trust funds to defend against a contest. And went even further to say that the, um, if, if the contestant was not successful in terms of, of um, having all of their inheritance uh, depleted, that they could, um, it was like a dollar for dollar deduction from their inheritance. Um, for the cost of the, the contest. So those are pretty draconian terms. And I think they're to be used in specific circumstances. I don't think you're going to be putting this in every single one of your plans. But know that you can put that in there to allow the trustee to pay for your fees if you have to be deposed. Yeah, the, the definitely read the Doolittle versus Exchange Bank. And it, it references CEB. So if I was... If I was still doing estate planning, I would I would dust off my plan and whatever program you use, whether it's Wealth Council or or its templates or whatever, um, compare it to what CEB um, is doing, what it was what was referenced in Doolittle. Um, in simple terms, it, it's that you wanted to say in the no contest clause that the trustee shall defend contests and any and all attacks on the trust um, that they may pay their attorney with trust funds. Um, that uh, that they can surcharge the share of the contestant, um, and um, that you, as the drafting attorney, will get paid for your, your normal hourly rate should you have to testify or be involved in the litigation thereafter. Um, and, and Doolittle said that that was enforceable uh, as long as it's actually actually Doolittle was in a document separate from the trust but executed simultaneously and the court held that it was part of it. I think the best practice is to actually stick it into the trust itself. Um, but again, that's a little outside of my bailiwick, so I'll let you guys um, decide how you best follow up with that. I just think it's a really good thing to help you. Um, it helps it helps you on a whole bunch of levels to protect your plan, right? It, it helps you get paid, which is important um, if you have to be deposed. But more importantly, it, it gives your trustee who is the champion that your client chose to defend this trust, um, the maximum amount of leverage to, to actually defend the trust. Um. So now we get into an area, a couple different areas, that are real quicksand for the inexperienced estate planner. Um, and it's important to think about these types of topics, capacity, undue influence, even before your initial client meeting, so that you can set yourself up to explain um, what you did, like, did you have your own protocol, like, while you were dealing with this person who's 85 and wants to disinherit one of their three children? Um, how did you, did you consider uh, in any way the 85-year-old as a different type of client than the 50-year-old? Or, or did you just go through your normal, um, you know, one, two, three, four, five normal step process? 
And, and what did you consider differently? So you, you'll be asked, um, did you ever take any notes specifically regarding the client's perceived capacity? Um, did you ever see any medical records? Did you uh, ever see any letters from physicians about the 85-year-old's capacity? Um, did you have any concern um, about the capacity? Um, did you believe that the client understood their relationship with their family members? And, and what was the basis for your understanding? Did you, um, did you believe that the client understood the, their assets? And what's the basis of your understanding? What dialogue did you have with that client? And what do your notes reflect about that? Um, you know, you'll be asked in the course of estate planning, have you ever had a client that you believe lacked capacity? You know, and what did you do then? And how is it different than what you did here with Mary? Um, and what is your understanding of uh, the capacity required to execute an estate plan? Um, you know, somebody such as Ms. Smith, who doesn't have a lot of experience in this area, she may not have thought about that before she's sitting at her deposition. And suddenly she's like, oh, wow, okay. She might be caught off guard. Um, so, but, but these are all important questions. Like, and how did you, how did you, Ms. Smith, determine that this client had testamentary capacity? Um, do you have a checklist or a procedure or a protocol? And what was it? And walk me through each step of that protocol. Um, so turning back to Ms. Smith, um, Ms. Smith, how did you assess Mary's capacity to make the trust amendment? Uh, well, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't perform any tests or anything. Uh, she, she seemed like a normal, you know, 80, 80 something year old. Um, she was kind of forgetful, but, you know, Carla was there to assist and um, remind her and describe in detail why she was there and the changes that she wanted to make. And, um, and, then, when, and then when Mary came to the realization that she needed the trust amendment, then, then she, you know, she was able to explain to me what it is that she wanted. Um, you know, Carla and, and her mom are just really close, so I didn't have any concerns. Okay, so now, <clears throat> now I'll drill down a little bit on on the the, the law um, in terms that's lurking behind uh, all these questions about capacity and the issue of capacity. Um, I'm sure, as most of you know, the probate code um, has a lot of detail uh, on testamentary capacity and then contractual capacity, section 6100, and then sections 810 through 812. Um, but I think this um, little snippet from Anderson B. Hunt hits it over the head, right? It's the testator's ability to appreciate the consequences of the particular act he or she wishes to take. And the relevant time period is at execution. Um, there are two presumptions that are just make contests based on capacity alone really, really difficult. In, in my opinion, this is just me. There's no law behind this. You can't cite to this. Almost every case, almost every contest is an undue influence case, not necessarily a capacity case. Capacity really sets up susceptibility to undue influence, but it's really rare that you actually win based on capacity. And that's because we're all presumed to have capacity until the court says we don't. Um, and even tighter, if a testator suffers from a condition with periods of lucidity, the law presumes the instrument was executed during a period of lucidity. So the contestant has the burden of proving that at the moment of execution, uh, the testator was not lucid. Again, drafting attorney is the bulletproof vest there. They're, they're going to say, no. They, at a minimum, they're gonna say, I don't have a specific recollection, but if they were showing any signs of not being lucid, I wouldn't have gone forward. And, and even that is really hard to get around unless you have some really powerful medical records really close in time to the date of execution. So, I mean, capacity, people like to talk about it in, in binary terms, kind of the, we used to say someone is competent or incompetent. Now we, now we talk in terms of capacity or more accurately, cognitive impairment. How impaired are they? And capacity to do what? What is it we're trying to do? Some transactions have a relatively low level of capacity required because they're relatively simple. 
the more complex it is, so the more complex the transaction that you're trying to draft is, um, how, more, how more complex the assets are in the estate, the higher the level of cognitive ability is gonna be required. And so I kind of think of it in these terms, but, um, and I've run this by Dr. Freitag and Dr. Clayton, and they both tell me that it's close enough, <laughs> that it works. Um, and that is kind of like when you're trying to assess uh, impairment uh, to drive, uh, you're going to get a DUI. Um, you know, if, uh, if someone has a, a single drink, um, they're going to probably have full motor skills and they're not going to be over the legal limit if they get tested. Um, but if they keep drinking, uh, they'll at some point, um, even if their motor skills are still intact because um, they're good drinkers and drivers, I guess, um, <laughs> they, they, they will go over the limit and they'll be technically not able to drive because they'll be over a 0.10, but it's hard to see, right? And you can't tell, even when you give them the test, they're gonna pass. Um, if they keep drinking at some point, they're gonna become um, both over the legal limit and they're gonna start, they'll fail a field test. And if they keep drinking, they're gonna be so inebriated that at, at a glance, you'll be able to tell they shouldn't be behind the wheel. Dementia kind of works like that, and, and cognitive impairment kind of works like that. Early on in the disease, it's difficult to tell. It's lurking underneath the surface, it's there. Sometimes it pops up because of infections. Urinary tract infections are a really common one. Mm -hmm. um, viruses, et cetera, where all of a sudden uh, they'll start showing symptoms of their dementia, and then that temporary condition is treated, and the symptoms go away. Um, but as it progresses, it becomes harder and harder to um, or easier and easier to uh, notice and harder and harder to ignore. We're not doctors, and everyone says that. I've, I've almost, I don't know if I've ever had a deposition where the drafting attorney did not say, I'm not a doctor. Um, but they're not, and they don't have a duty to determine capacity. But they are holding themselves out as experts. They do have eyes and ears, and um, I think that they do uh, have to make sure that they are, if they're doing their job well, um, memorialize what they are observing in the person's mannerisms and what they're wearing in their attitude, their concerns, and like I said, the ultimate questions, things that will show a neutral audience that they did understand the consequences of what you were drafting and that it wasn't an easy decision, that it actually was a difficult decision that they made after a lot of thought um, and why they did it makes sense. Gambling, disagreement with religion, don't like their choice in a partner, whatever it is, there are lots of excuses that if you drill down a little bit, and, and, I, and I think that's just your job, it's not like you have to be an investigator or a cop about it, and, and you can tell them, look, I'm sorry, I'm being a little personal here, but I, again, I'm trying to make this plan work, I need to make sure what's going on in your life right now that makes this decision make sense and record all of it. That, that's as tight as it gets right there because no one, you know, this presumption of lucidity, this is my last point and we'll move on, is, is deadly, really deadly because there's few medical conditions <laughs> that don't have moments of lucidity. Um, and few clients go to a neuropsych eval on their way to your office. <laughs> so it, 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 it is a, very tough road to hoe. And that's the perfect segue. Back to our deposition with Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith, you testified earlier today that you only met with Mary one time. So what is your understanding as to the how and when Mary executed the trust amendment? Oh, uh, well, you know, I knew that Mary had mobility issues. And so I told Carla that when the you know, the documents are ready, she could just come by my office and pick them up and that a mobile notary could come to the house and help them sign everything. So I, I didn't need to be there for the execution. I, I mean, that was me taking in consideration, you know, her, her mobility and everything. So, you know, I thought I was doing the right thing for her. So you weren't present at the execution and you have no idea about Mary's lucidity uh, while she was actually signing the trust amendment? Um, you know, I got the documents later and, you know, her, her signature was on all the pages and in the right places, so, um, and it was notarized, so, yes, it was good. We are going to, so there's, 
Um, there's patterns that we see again and again in litigation, and you'll probably all be familiar with them. They came up in the earlier presentation this afternoon. Um, there's a typical elder abuse victim, sadly, and it's often women, women outlive men, as we all see in our business, and um, it's often women who are older than 75 and are dependent on others for care. Um, and some, some risk factors that can make it even more dangerous is if that elder also abuses alcohol or some other type of sub substance that can make them um, more, per more easily preyed upon than somebody who does not have those um, dependencies. Also, a lot of times, it's, it's not the feisty 80-year-old who tells you everything, they, that tells you things that, the way they want things. It's more of the self-deprecating um, person who uh, can be isolated and maybe not have much of a social life outside of that one adult child or neighbor or somebody who's helping, helping them with daily tasks. Um, um, yeah, I'm going to... The one thing I'd like to add to that is that um, feisty people are actually really easy to manipulate as well by keeping them angry, right? And there's the, there's classic methods that people do it. They're going to put you in a home. They want control of your money. Um, they're going to take your dog away. They're going to make you stop drinking. They're going to make you stop smoking. If you stick with me, we're going to keep partying. <laughs> you know, um, and, and it's easy to keep those people that are ornery fired up. Um, sometimes. Uh, anyway. Um, and then sadly, there's also a typical elder abuser, and it goes to the failure to launch type person that the previous panel was discussing. Um, it's somebody who is in their 50s and 60s or 60s. They've not had a lot of economic consistency in their career, um, and they may have been depending on their parents for money, for rent or food or something for, for a long time. Um, and this same individual also tends to think of themselves as an unsung hero who's there for the parent um, when other people are not there to take them to an appointment. Um, they're not consistently working, so they have more free time to go to a medical appointment, uh, potentially. Um, there's a lot of economic uncertainty for this individual, and they tend to think of their parent as their retirement plan um, because, uh, you know, um, Ninety percent of the cases involve family members. Fifty percent, approximately, involve adult children. But there can also be um, actions by other uh, imp people employed by the elder, such as attorneys, financial advisors, bank employees, or just people who come into their day-to-day -day life, such as neighbors or often caregivers. I mean, we've all seen um, the caregiver. Uh, so it's just be aware. I mean, there's patterns. You've seen them. It's it's, it's common sense. Um, moving on to that, those people who are doing the undue influence, um, kind of similar to capacity, you're going to want to have a protocol, you're going to want to be watching out for the Carlas of the world who are driving their parent to the appointment every time, the people who are too interested, the people who want to communicate to you directly about the changes in, for the trust amendment. Um, you're going to be asked, what is your understanding of undue influence when it comes to an estate plan? Um, did you suspect that this client was being unduly influenced? Um, or in any of your cases, did you expect that? And what do you, or did you suspect that? And what did you do when you suspected that? Uh, you know, have you had any uh, meetings or telephone calls with the individual who is now the alleged undue influencer, like alone? In our fact pattern, um, Ms. Smith had several conversations, both in person and over the telephone, with, with Carla. So you're just going to have to be thinking about these things and what is your plan um, to try to prevent it or uh, have it at least well documented in your file that you were not part of the problem. Um, there's a question for Ms. Smith. Um, were you concerned, Ms. Smith, that Carla may have been unduly influencing Mary? Oh, no, not at all. Uh, you know, Carla was so devoted to Mary. Um, you know, I, I knew that Carla would do anything for Mary. She, she dropped everything to, you know, be by her side. 
her bakery business was faltering. I think she was actually facing foreclosure uh, because she was spending so much time taking care of Mary. And, um, you know, um, you know, Mary said that she loves, you know, loves her kids equally, but Carla was, you know, reminding her about how Art never comes to see her, never came to see her after Bud died, and she doesn't even know her own grandchildren. And so when, um, when she mentioned that, Carla, you know, Carla really got, I mean, I'm sorry, Mary got really upset. And, um, you know, she just said, you know, that Art, he just, he never showed any interest in me since Dad died. So, no, I, I think, you know, Carla was getting what she deserved. Um, before I drill down on a little bit of the, the uh, undue influence law real quick, uh, I want to follow up on that. Um, the, the typical elder abuser, influencer kind of profile. Um, I think that being... Um, the main ingredients in contests are usually someone who's dumb, mean, and has a really strong sense of entitlement. Those three things, no matter who the person is, they, it seems to lurk in there. Um, in my experience, there's basically four different scenarios. The one that, that uh, Jeff hit on, I call the baby Huey, which is the 50-year-old who lives in the basement on disability and is fully supported by his parents. Uh, the second one that I call Cinderella because it's the evil stepmother. I actually think that's probably the most common scenario for litigation in general, not necessarily undue influence. Uh, then they, they just good old fashioned sibling rivalry. They can't get along. Uh, I call that Cain and Abel or Jacob and Esau. Just going back to the Old Testament. And then these attorneys, financial advisors, bank employees. I call that one Rasputin. There's just some. Svengali advisor that somehow has got the ear of the elder and they trust them implicitly for some weird reasons, usually because their spouse died and this person's kind of taken the role of their spouse. Um, but the law on a new influence, again, really helpful. Uh, the standard's clear and convincing evidence. Um, the contestant has the burden of proving that the, that this plan is the result of undue influence. Um, it's very difficult to overpower someone's mind unless they have something going on with their brain to make them susceptible. So even though it's not an element, I think it is a necessary ingredient. Um, and the way I explain that is to say everyone has someone who has um, a greater deal of influence over them than, than other people may. Uh, for me, it's my wife, right? She has more influence over me than anyone else. But she can't make me do things that I don't want to do um, Within reason, <laughs> right? But as uh, we get older and uh, my brain starts to not function as well, that influence gets stronger and stronger. And again, going back to some of the neuropsychs uh, that I've worked with, influence isn't the problem unless it's undue. You know, we, you can, it's okay if someone asks you, I'm thinking of doing this to my plan, what do you think, to give them your opinion. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of reducing your brother's share what, because um, he doesn't come visit. What do you think about that? Well, it's been a long time since he visited. If that's true, okay. Now, if you say, Andy has a gambling problem, and he's a tweaker, and he doesn't take care of his kids, do you want me to drive you to the air, uh, airport? Uh, do you want to, do you want, should we uh, take some of the money out now? All of a sudden, you're getting a lot closer to undue influence, right? Um, but circling back, in your defense here, um, as the drafters, they have a very difficult proof burden. Uh, the problem is, for the contestant, is... No one ever sees or hears anyone saying anything in the open because the influencer isn't dumb enough to do so. Um, and so the contestant gets this little bump uh, from the case law, which is if it can show, make a showing, um, it can shift the burden to the trustee and the drafting attorney um, indirectly to um, prove that there was no undue influence. Um, and that's hard, that's hard to prove. It's hard to prove a negative. So this shifting burden is really what the litigator is, is going all in on, in my opinion, in most contests. They want to shift this burden to the trustee, to the proponent of the document. Um, and we want, as the drafting attorney, to stop them uh, at the wall. How do they do it? 
they got to show these three things. Um, that the first one's always there. They to show a confidential relationship. Um, if they're a child, they automatically have one. But it's almost always that element is shown. It's the other two where there's a fight. And again, your testimony is going to be very important because you're supposed to prevent them from participating. Participating, you know, the estate planning is your realm there, and you're running your game plan, and you ran it well, and therefore uh, the kid was in the lobby. You weren't communicating with them about disposition. They would, they did not participate. Um, and with respect to a new benefit, um, again, you're darn right. I did my job. I discussed this in great detail. I memorialized why this unequal distribution makes sense, and I vetted the story as well as I could see my file. Um, I had um, a, a one attorney in a deposition did a particularly good job, I felt. Usually when asked, weren't you concerned about the niece and the nephew? These emails make it seem like they're very pushy. Drafting attorney said, you're damn right I was. They're, they give me the creeps. Like they, they were all over the place. And so I actually changed the way I addressed things to make sure that I met with her more often. I met with her three times. I met with her over an hour every time. I made sure they weren't there. I called her. Um, I, did, I went above and beyond to make sure that that influence wasn't really affecting this particular decision. I thought that was a really unique but powerful answer, and it, it, the, the judge agreed. Wait, which um, part? The creepy part or the... No, no, well, they were creepy. <laughs> they were certainly creepy. Um, um, and, and, um, but I don't believe, despite the fact that they were trying, I don't think it was their influence that, that, that caused the decision. Um, and, and I thought that the drafting attorney did a particularly good job in keeping them at bay. Mm -hmm. That's really what, what, yeah, what I meant there. Well. But, but no, they were certainly creepy. Um, <laughs> they were trying. So. So we talked a lot about um, papering your file, especially with the, the big question of why. You know, you want to throw that into your notes, invoices even, like when you're saying, oh, trust amendment, Ray, Art is just narrative, you know, just as much as possible so that there's not going to be any questions about that. Um, and eventually, you're going to be, Miss Smith is going to be at her deposition, and she's going to be asked, um, why did Mary want this trust amendment? Um, you know, I, I really didn't want to pry. Uh, I thought it was really more of a, you know, a, a family matter. And, um, and I, you know, I was just, um, I didn't think it was really any of my business. So, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, Miss Smith, we are very much looking forward to your trial testimony, um, and you will be receiving a trial subpoena from us very shortly, so thank you. Um, and one more thing we thought about while we were working on um, this undue influence piece, so Art in this case is being disinherited, and there's been different times where Mary has told Miss Smith that Art has plenty of money, he's not going to be worried, um, and one thing... It would be interesting to hear from the group if they've ever done this. Um, it, is it possible to get a consent from Art? So he knows while Mary is alive, he's being disinherited, partly because he has plenty of money. Mary loves all three of her children the same. Um, and get him to consent so that that can take away that potential fear in the future for litigation. And uh, yeah, so the good news is, again, to try to cheer this up versus how we started out. The law is quite favorable to the drafting attorney. You know, it, it provides this great foundation upon which you can build a strong estate plan um, as long as you're keeping that in the forefront from the, from the get-go. Um, take advantage of those advantages. You know, lean into them. Um, with respect to the active participation um, element of trying to shift the burden, um, it's nice to know here that motive and opportunity is not enough. Simply being in the room at execution is not enough. Um, and then this quote here, which is used by every person defending a trust ever, um, urging a decedent to make a testamentary instrument, arranging an appointment with an attorney, being present at the execution of the testamentary instrument, and discussing the provisions of the testamentary instrument with a decedent are not enough to establish actual participation. That sounds really good. Obviously, if any of those, if there is really, really strong evidence of those, that can change it. But what this is saying is those things by themselves are not enough. Um, and 
this element is, is going to be a focus of every litigator, and so it should be the focus of every drafting attorney. Um, same with undue benefit. Um, the important part here is that it requires a qualitative assessment of the relationship between the decedent and the beneficiary. Every contestant is going to say, because it's not equal, it's unfair to me, and therefore it's an undue benefit. And case law is very, very clear that that is not true. That it, it could make sense to leave everything you have to a charity. It could make sense to leave everything you have to a friend instead of a family member. Or like in this case here, the Reardon case, the court found that the nephew was the natural object of the testator's bounty over his nine living children, um, where there had been prolonged separation from the adult children and the testator was extremely close to the nephew. I think this is important from the drafting attorney's point of view too, because this means they did that assessment with nine different individuals. Very often, someone will meet in my office and they'll say, like, um, someone will be contesting. They'll be accusing them of influencing someone. And I'll say, okay, um, that's one of the first things I want to know is what are they going to say about why you got disinherited? Um, and I want to hear that. The flip, I want to hear why uh, from the proponent. Why did these other, in this case, nine people, usually it's only a couple, why did they get disinherited? And he'll say, oh, well, uh, you know, Jimmy got mad at my mom and called her a bunch of names and um, they got into a big fight. And so th that's when she told me she wanted to go see a lawyer. And I'm like, great. What about the other two? You know, she disinherited three people. You got a good story for one. And, and you have to go through this analysis across the board. So I, I think just keep that in mind. Also with grandchildren, um, a lot of times people will are much harsher with their children than they are with their grandchildren. They give the, 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 their, they'll disinherit a child, um, but they won't go, they wouldn't have disinherited the grandchild, especially if they have a close relationship. And you can kind of see the undue influence there where it doesn't make so, you, you kind of have to drill down sometimes a couple of generations the older they get. The grandkids may be 40 something, you know, um, and this trust may be 30 years old. So um, I think it's really important to, to push. Um, on the story and get as much info as you can. Okay, so, you know, I hope we haven't terrified you all about your estate plan, but just know that there are ways that you can enhance your practice, and they're, they're up here. Um, of all these things, I mean, they're all important, but the one that I personally find just really, really helpful is joining a study group. Um, it doesn't matter how many plans that you've drafted. There's always something that something new that comes up, and having you know a brain trust of other planners that you can you know uh, talk about things, talk about issues is just so incredibly helpful. Especially if you're a solo practitioner, um, you talking to yourself and you know among the four walls of your office just isn't going to cut it. So make sure you network. Make sure you have you know a mentor. If you don't want to do a group thing, then you know make sure you have a mentor that can at least look over your documents to see how, you know, how you're doing things. Um, it's just incredibly helpful. So with that, I think um, we do have some additional materials um, at the end of the, um, the PowerPoint. We'll just kind of leave those for you to mm -hmm. peruse. Mm -hmm. um, They're going to send those out later. Yeah, we're sending these out later. I just want to make one small point. Um, just in case we didn't have enough material for you, I wanted to talk about specific gifts, making specific gifts of real estate in particular, and how sometimes when you plan that way, you could end up un unintentionally having an unequal distribution. So in our case, it was, you know, a one piece of property to each one of the kids, to our Bud and Mary, but, you know, uh, it turns out that during Mary's lifetime, she needed to use up her assets. And Carla was the one who was selling off the, the real estate. So now suddenly the kids that were supposed to be equal are not equal. So just beware of that potential. And there's some there's a, uh, some tips in there for you to take a look at. So Yeah, along those lines, there's a couple of big things that I see estate planners do that I really, really, really wish they would, and I'll hit them quickly. Um, one is, as they mentioned earlier today, having co-trustees. I really fight back on that one. It is such a bad idea to have multiple trustees. Um, you're basically, you know, almost ensuring that if any disagreement happens, their only option is to go to court to try to address it. 
Um, as she pointed out, specific bequests, particularly of real property, are a really bad idea as well because um, if the you need to sell one of them, uh, redemption kicks in, and that you know. So if you have three properties, you leave them to the three kids. The couple continues to live. You have to sell one of them, sell Johnny's house. Uh, then you get to this uh, problem where Johnny gets hosed and the other two get a house. Um, whereas if they just got equal shares, um, they can agree to buy each other out of houses, right? And if one of them happens to live in the house and has lived there for 20 years, you can reference that and say, with precatory language, I really wish everyone would let this person buy this house, work with them to do it, it is my wish. But you don't get into the situation where um, someone's trying to hose the other kids uh, because of, of they needed the money for their care in their later years. Um, so I think now we're ready for, ready for questions. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, I saw your hand up first. Join the presentation. Thank you so much. I will not be sending clients to Taylor. <laughs> um, for doing certificates of independent review. Can you build language in your trust? Have you seen examples where that attorney can get paid out of the trust? That's very interesting. I I don't see why not, because actually in Doolittle they also reference and in the CEB materials that I have seen, uh, they reference including CPAs, other advisors, I think even like doctors. And uh, I'm not sure whether the court weighed in on specifically whether the non-attorneys could, but the Certificate of Independent Review seems to me to be analogous. But, wait, um, I, mean, but I don't know the answer to that. But wouldn't you be doing a Certificate of Review when the testator is still alive? Right. So that they would be paying for it. No, 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 but then they're going to get called later to yeah. testify. Oh, 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 I see, I see, I see. Have seen examples oh, of okay. building that language in so that... I, I haven't, but I would. get the CRR done sometimes, and if they're aware of that, hey, there's money there potentially to help the family. Yeah, it makes sense to me. But I, I don't think, I don't know every case law that actually addresses it. Because um, there's Doolittle in there, and there's one case after Doolittle that distinguishes it on uh, a different point. Um, that's a good question, though. I, I would use certificates of independent review. Aggressively. Yeah. Tracy. I have found sometimes that elders are not realistic about their children and don't want to be honest because it seems like it would be helpful if they would just come out and say, he's a loser, I don't want him to be homeless when I'm dead. But I couldn't have to say that. So how do you enlist that and get the truth? Because I feel like if they say, oh, my other one has plenty of money, but that turns out not to be true, then it can be Challenge on their, their inaccurate belief or whatever. Yeah, I mean, you are. I mean, you're stuck with the story they'll give you, right? That's the problem. All of us lawyers are, are stuck with the version that our clients give us. Um, I, I don't think there's any way around it other than to be pushy um, and to try to explain to them that, like, you know, the more information, the better. But if they're lying to you, I mean, you're, you know, you're stuck. Uh, the, the same problem occurs in litigation, right? Where um, I've never had anyone come in and say, uh, yeah, I stole money from my grandma. I'd like you to help me get away with it, right? Like, they, they don't. They, they profess to the bitter end that they're, even if you literally tell them, look, I, I don't care what you did as long as you are like, going to follow the rules now and allow me to help you get the best deal under the confines of the law I can, they'll still keep trying to convince you that they're saying the, the, the rotten ones in my experience. So now, do you have any I mean I think it's the that, tricks of the trade? I think it's the why. You know, it's it's kind of going and ask trying to draw out from them a little bit more information about well why is Bud Jr. living in the basement? And why is it that he's not able to hold a job? And why do you feel that it's, you know, that you need to keep paying for his rent and his food and et cetera, et cetera. So maybe by, you know, drawing out and having them say it out loud, <laughs> then maybe they're like, yeah, he's a loser. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
You know, I, so having a special needs trust for for the Hueys because they're on uh, disability and they don't want to lose their benefits. Right, but also as a way to kind of control the use of the trust. So I so if they're truly disabled, I I would say yes. And then I, I have seen tr trust that kind of mimic a special needs trust. Um, the classic example is like a drug trust where they try to say someone has to be clean. Um, the problem with that, in my opinion, is that it's so impossible to enforce that it's almost not. I mean, I guess it's better than not having that in there, maybe. But it um, and the drug, the, 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 the drug issue is the most difficult one. Right. I think that's like the vein that runs through the cases the most and it's usually meth and or opiates, right? Like there's something about them that just turns people into monsters and their parents don't want to, uh, admit it. And, um, and they've been battling it forever, you know, and unfortunately they, they continue to fight the exact same fight, you know, through after they're dead. Um, so I, I haven't really seen one that, that, works if the person is dead set against it, right? So I, I think it's like a lot of estate planning, you have provisions in there, you're hoping th that people will follow them, whether they're enforceable or not, you know? Uh, at least the, 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 the intent is clear and, and um, it gives you a starting point. I always like to be able to argue unique provisions. So I, as a litigator, I love unique provisions because I get to walk into court and say, you see, Your Honor, like we, they saw this day coming. They saw this day coming, and they did everything they could to help me right now. And so please, you know, give us the relief we're looking for. This this provision didn't pop out of thin air. It's not boilerplate. It's 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 obviously carefully crafted, and it should be given its weight. Um, again, that, that, sometimes that will be enough to carry the day to get the judge to be a little more aggressive than they normally would if it's if the document's silent. So kind of like the notes, I, I, I begin, but again, I'm not an estate planner. I don't see a lot of estate planners writing the rationale into the documents. Um, as a litigator, I like that idea because I think it's the most, it's the, it's in your face, right? Like it, it, it is hitting the nail on the head. Um, but it's hard going back to what Tracy said that a lot of clients don't want that in there. They're cowardly, for lack of a better word, right? They don't want to address this issue. They would much rather everyone deal with it after they're gone. Um, and I think all you can do is to point that out to them and say, and try to <laughs> inspire them to have some courage and address it while they're still alive because it's so much easier. In we didn't brought this up, but you can literally, um, you can file a petition to confirm validity while the person is still alive. Um, we're working on a case that involves it right now. And my... Uh, Good friend and former colleague, I guess, Andy Verrier has written an article about it. Uh, if anyone's interested in it, you can find it by Googling it. And uh, I really wish more people would do that because the few times I've been involved with it, it's been incredibly effective because the person's there. Yeah. It's why a lot of times the contestants don't bring it up until after death because they know that despite the fact that grandma's demented, that if they press her on the issue, she's going to say, no, I did it. <laughs> you know why I did it, right? Um and they want to wait until she's gone so there's no one to have that voice. Okay. So there was just one more question. You patiently waited in front. And one question on Sue. Um, is work product, including attorney's notes, discoverable after the death of the client? Good question. That's a very good question. Good question. So attorney client privilege is easy. That That is destroyed with respect to testamentary intent upon death. And the, it's the a series of evidence code sections. I can't, I don't, I'm not good with the numbers off the top of my head, but um, the, that, that's the easy part. And the rationale is that uh, we presume that everyone would want after their death uh, for people that are going to inherit from them to know what their intent was. And so the attorney-client privilege gets destroyed. My understand, I believe that work product remains. It, it does. I mean, I don't have the latest case law at my fingertips, but I did read that when we were getting ready for this. Work product is still protected. Yeah. Um, it's just that fine line of making sure that it falls within the, that category and not the intent of the decedent. Yeah. And, and so there, I would make sure that this gets really hard in the moment, I understand. But to the extent you can, right, you want to weave your 
your work product, your thoughts, your opinions into it, as opposed to um, just quotations or factual observations to have, if it's something that you believe should be protected. Uh, on the other hand, if it's clear, um, I, I, I like the idea of quotes, like I said earlier in the case I referenced, that you're speaking with the decedent's voice. You know, um, it's not going to be protected, but it's going to be super powerful. And you probably wouldn't have put it in your notes if it wasn't relevant to material. So. I would like to uh, thank our speakers for a very educational presentation. And I would also like to vouch for the fact that Taylor Smith has no relation whatsoever to Esther Kim. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So now, uh, thank you all for attending our presentation today. There is refreshments out in the lobby. Feel free to mingle, as our speakers uh, told us about, as solo and small firms. We don't want you working in a vacuum, so feel free to have some hors d'oeuvres and have a drink and chat about uh, questions that this presentation may have raised.